Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And today's a little bit of a diversion, but it's all about innovation. I'm pleased to welcome my guest, Virginia Postrel. She is the author of Fabric of Civilization, How Textiles Made the World. Virginia, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Um, and I did warn you, I'm, I'm sorry, can you yeah. pull your microphone just a little oh, yeah. closer to your mouth, just yeah, a little yeah. more in front yeah. there, just a tad yeah. more? How's that? Oh, much more gooder. Yes, okay. Thank you. So, hi, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Virginia Postrel. I am, as Robert says, the author most recently of The Fabric of Civilization. This is my fourth book. Uh, my first book, which uh, some of you may be familiar with, was called The Future and Its Enemies, and it's very much about innovation. It's... Uh, getting close to 25 years old, but still quite relevant. Uh, my second book was called The Substance of Style and was about the look and feel of people, places, and things and the economic value created by that and why. Uh, that came out in 2003. In 2013, I published a book called The Power of Glamour, uh, which is an analysis of glamour as a form of rhetoric, persuasion uh, that takes many different forms. It's not just fashion. It's not just movies. It could be cars. It could be the idea of technology uh, or the idea of the future uh, and uh, how that plays out in culture, politics, economics, uh, his, in history. Um, I write for Bloomberg Opinion. I've been a columnist and uh, you know, sort of a writer for a long time, a very long time. And I am a visiting fellow at the Smith Institute for uh, Political Economy and Philosophy at Chapman University in Orange, California. Gotcha. And one of your colleagues there is my friend uh, and yours, Joel Kotkin. Who, uh, yes, he's think, not with the Smith Institute, but he is at Chapman. And yes, to give you some idea of how old I am and how old Joel is. <laughs> <laughs> I first knew Joel when I was a rookie, a very young reporter at Inc. Magazine from 1984 to 86. <laughs> and when I was the editor of Reason Magazine in the 90s, and actually before I was the editor when I was on the staff, he wrote for us some. And so we go way back. I haven't seen him in a long time, but we, yeah, I've known him for a long time. Good. Well, Joel's, uh, Joel's uh, he's remarkably prolific, and he's been on the podcast a couple times, but uh, this isn't about Joel. Uh, it's, about <laughs> your, it's about your book. And um, oh, wait, now here I've got a, I wasn't quite, I thought I was fully prepared. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not. But here I, this is, I, I bought your book and I bought it on my Kindle and I, I and I've now ordered it on uh, the paper copy because ah, as I was reading is. it, I thought, hey, you know, the Kindle's okay, but I, I love books, right? I, I've yeah. written a few myself and because of the texture and everything in the book, I, I realized, well, and my wife wants to read it and I thought, well, Lauren wants to read it and we both love fabric. And so we've now, so you're getting your money's yeah. worth from me as well, the, uh, the, the podcast or who has not only bought the Kindle version, but the hardcover version. So I'll, I uh, encourage everyone to do it. I should tell people that unless it changed this morning, the Kindle version is on sale for Three ninety nine, which okay. is like super deal. Well, I, I'm sure I paid more than that, but <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. But at, at that deal, even if you have the hardback or the paperback, it's worth buying so you can search it. And I did this with all my books. I I bought. I actually paid money for my own books to have them on Kindle, so I, they were searchable. Even though, like you, I actually like to read physical books. Yeah. Well, first, I just have to say, I loved this book. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not flattering you or to, since we're going to talk about textiles, blowing smoke up your dress or anything else here. I, I just thought it was amazingly well written. And I love fabric as well. I've been, and, and the things you wrote about and how you wrote about it, I thought were just you know, beautifully written and well done. So congratulations first. I want to just well, uh, thanks make that. very much. Um, so tell us about the hieroglyphics at uh, am i saying it now uh, this is the right the beginning of your book at nosos is that right the uh, uh I, I think the k is pronounced knosos knosos but, okay yeah. um here you, you, you i'll read this it's right at the beginning of you said knosos was a textile superpower 
Like many people before and since, the pioneering archaeologist who had found it had overlooked the central role of textiles in the history of technology, commerce, and civilization itself. And you <clears throat> you found that the hieroglyph hieroglyphics there, the writing, was all about the textiles that they were making, which was really an amazing discovery by itself. And that, and that after that, I thought, okay, I'm all in here. Go, keep going. <laughs> Yeah, this was a really interesting. I met this woman uh, called uh, Marie Louisa Nash, who is an expert in Linear B tablets. That's how she, she's a historian. She's a, uh, an ancient historian, and she uh, is that's her her field of expertise. But then she learned as she went along that two thirds of these tablets are about textile production. So then she became very interested in ancient textiles and actually was a co-founder of uh, what's called the Center for Textile Research at the University of Copenhagen. And I met her and that's how I, I learned about this. But it's very interesting because Arthur Evans, who was this pioneering archeologist who discovered the Greeks, uh, the, the, uh, civilization on the island of Crete, which predated the ancient Greeks, uh, he he fa he deciphered some of these tablets, and he and a lot of there is something that's like an alphabet, but they're also symbolic things, uh, like you find in uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, and and he figured out, you know, this one means a pod, and this one means sort of, and there was this one that he thought meant a tower. It was like a little, tr a little rectangle with little things on, it, little pointy things on it, and and he actually got it upside down because it didn't mean a tower; it meant a textile, and it, this was figured out later in, in the context. And it, it it shows he was living in, you know, in England in the 19th century where textiles were a huge industry, and yet he's so focused on what we think of as this. You know, world of stone and and military might and temples, and, and he doesn't and, think and, about and, and metal, right? Which and was metal, the other, yeah, yeah right. right. And and he doesn't think about textiles, which ancient people thought a lot about textiles, actually. Uh, but because they rotted away, uh, we tend to forget how prevalent they were and how important they were, whether it was in trade or in uh, you know cultural things like religious activities or even in I talk about some about the possible roots of uh, mathematical early Greek mathematical theory uh, so part of what this book is doing is it's sort of restoring textiles to the human story um, and also then by using textiles we can see a lot of things about various aspects of innovation various aspects of you know, historical patterns, cultural exchange, conquest, uh, trade, uh, all of the things that make up human history. S slavery in the American slavery South. Slavery in uh, the American South. In industrial uh, Revolution, yeah, uh, silk, yeah. the Silk Road, uh, all yeah. these things. Uh, yeah. I just thought the way you wove it together yeah, yeah. was just, I mean, really quite beautifully done. And particularly, I thought, well, this is the story of innovation, and it, from plant breeding to dyes, etc. But I want to read the part of this is the beginning of your book, uh, because you, you put so many of these, <laughs> it's just great, well, so well written. We repeat threadbare cliches, whole cloth, hanging by a thread, dyed in the wool. We catch airline shuttles, weave through traffic, follow comet threads. We speak of lifespans and spinoffs and never wonder why drawing out fibers and twirling them into thread looms so large in our language. Surrounded by textiles, we're largely oblivious to their existence and to the knowledge and efforts embodied in every scrap of fabric. Yet the story of textiles is the story of human ingenuity. Um, I want to keep going here. It, 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 you said textiles let us trace progress and in interactions of practical techniques and scientific theory, the cultivation of plants and breeding of animals, the spread of mechanical innovations and measurement of stand measurement standards, the recording and replication of patterns, the manipulation of chemicals. We can watch knowledge spread from one place to another, sometimes in written form, but more often through human contact or the exchange of goods. It's just beautifully written. I mean, well, at a girl. I mean, I just I read it. And I, <laughs> Thank you. I read it and I thought, damn, that is so good. I wish I'd written that. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but tell me, okay, so well, first things first, I mean, we, this goes out on, on audio. Some people only listen on audio, others watch it on YouTube. A lot more people are watching it on YouTube, but you're wearing a, a fabric there that looks like it's a tie dye or something. Yeah, what is so that that this you're wearing is actually, now? so this, this is, is not actually, accidental that you yeah, you've dressed for the, you dress for the podcast. This is actually a right? print. Oh, I mean, okay. So this is, a, but it's an emulation of a tie dye. So nowadays, a lot of things that you'll find, I mean, I just bought this in a, you know, th this one doesn't have a story behind it. I think I, you know, got it at Banana Republic or something. Okay. I do have I do have shirts that have stories behind them, but but this is an example of an imitation of a complex tie dye kind of uh, patterning, which is something that you find in many different cultures. You know, we associate it with kind of the the hippie Grateful Dead kind of tie dyes, but you find various ways of creating patterning by blocking off certain parts uh, before you die uh, in, in many different uh, cultures. And it tends to be actually quite a precise art uh, where people devote a great deal of time to the preparation of the cloth before, or, or in some cases, even uh, tying off the threads. Then you dye the threads and then you re bring them out and you weave them and the pattern has been put there in the dye. Uh, there's a, a common version of that. It's called ECOT, which I, I, this is a version I really like. Yeah. Sure. Well, so it was there, I, I have my own history of textiles and weaving, but w was there a moment when you realized, okay, this is a book I have to write? Was there some moment where you thought, you know, or, or that you had, had had some experience with textiles as a child or something? I, I, it's, I read a little bit about your inspiration, but yeah. it, it, delve into that if you would. So, uh, so, it was a collection of a lot of different things. I have this long-standing interest in innovation. I have a long-standing interest in economic history. Over a period of quite a, I mean, really probably more than a decade, I would hear a paper here. I would, there's a story in the book about, I know, there's a video also on my YouTube channel about calico prohibition in France for 73 years. Uh, France treated you know, cotton print fabrics, the way we treat cocaine. And that was just, I heard somebody give a talk about that. And I was like, wow, how did I never hear about this? This is so wild. Uh, probably where it really coalesced was when I went to a conference in 2014 of the Textile Society of America. That's where I first heard about kenosis and these tablets and several other papers. And I thought there's just so much interesting here. First, I wrote it a long article, a feature article, uh, and that kind of kicked it off. And then over and where, a period, and where did you and where did you publish that? I published that in the online magazine Aon. Okay. Uh, and and which is, you know, it re it got a great response, including from an editor who was like, "This would be a good book." And I was like, "Well." I, I'm not ready to write a book right at this particular moment in my time, but I'll get back to you. And then a few years later, we had, I, I, I did do a proposal and he, by that time had left the publisher, but I actually, he had, was at basic books and that's where I ended up. Although we did shop the, uh, the book around. Yeah. But it was, it was published now. It's two years old. It was November of yeah. 2020. It was published. So almost yes, exactly right. two years ago. Um, and I first heard about it uh, when we met uh, last summer, I think at the Breakthrough Institute, Breakthrough I read, Institute, your, I read yeah. your bio and I thought fabric of civilization. And I thought immediately I thought, this is a book I want to read. I thought this was interesting. And then I downloaded it that day. And then I believe I introduced myself and said, yeah. Hey, I want to have you on the podcast. So now here we are, however many months later. Um, well, I also have to get this one. So do you have a favorite fabric? Are you a cotton? I'm a, I'm all about cotton. I, I don't wear, I don't like synthetic fabrics. I don't, I don't much even like wool. I mean, I wear some, but I don't oh. silk, but I'm, I'm all about cotton. What is there something? So, what about you? Okay. I hate wool. <laughs> really? I, I have very, very sensitive skin. I can't wear even like cashmere, even fancy, uh, thing. but I, I do and, like and cotton. This dress, and this dress you're wearing is, is cotton. Is cotton. Yeah. yeah. So I do wear a lot of cotton. I'd also like silk, but you know, it's not necessarily an everyday fabric, but sure. I would say those are my two uh, favorite. I, I think I, I'm not an ant anti-synthetic person and particularly not as much as I was when I was younger, partly because synthetics have improved a lot, polyester yeah. in particular. Uh, but mostly I would say I probably wear cotton, 
you know, the majority of the time. Yeah. And do you do you? I, I, well, the, the, you also talk about owning a loom, and do you sew? Yeah. Do you do you do you weave? Do you do any of that? Do you have time for that? Or? Yeah, I don't have as much time as I would like for it. I so I learned to weave while I was doing the research for the book. It was not something that inspired the book. I came to a point fairly early in my research where being a somewhat spatially challenged individual, I thought I am never I keep I can read as many descriptions of looms as I but want, but I'm not really you, understanding how they you have work. To get your fingers in there yeah. yourself. So I went online and I uh, found what I now know to be the Southern California California Hand Weaver Skilled page, and there's a page on there where it's, it's a list of play, people who teach weaving in the LA area where I live, and I found a woman who lived near me and had a few lessons with her in her house, and uh, you know, and after three lessons, I knew everything I knew for, needed for the book, but she invited me to come to this annual event called WEF that the festival that the guild puts on every year and I went and I kind of basically I got hooked on it I really like the idea of weaving I don't have as much time to do it as I would like and setting up a loom for a new batch of weaving takes a lot of time and effort sure. uh, but but I do enjoy it and w there and I have different kinds of looms I mean I have a loom for weaving bands and belts called an ankle loom you know things like that as well as a, a, a regular and, and you went to several different textile makers. And did you have a, a you, you yeah. wrote about Guatemala and what you wrote about Guatemala, I think was quite interesting. I've been there a couple of times. Was there a favorite among those? And I, we'll, we'll get back to the book on some of those things. But I, to me, yeah. fabric is such a, and textiles are such a personal thing, right? right because right. they're very... Well, uh, they're yeah, so it depends on whether you mean as a consumer or as a sort of researcher or what. I, I had a wonderful time in Guatemala. Uh, the and uh, really enjoy their textiles, although I don't think a lot of their traditional clothing is kind of heavy. Right. Uh, it's all cotton, so yeah. I like that about it. So I also went to Peru, and traditional Peruvian textiles are amazing, but they're all alpaca and I, or, or wool, so I don't like them. Like I don't like the way they feel. Like, right. I like right. the way they look. Um, I also went to India, uh, and in India I went to both – contemporary factories and I did a, a, a workshop on traditional printmaking which is you know the dyes and, and prints in India are a big part of the the heritage and the history of uh, I, so I liked all that the most amazing things I saw that I have a short video on YouTube about this are these um, uh, sort of 16th 17th century uh, uh, Italian silk, it's called silk throwing mills, but where they made silk thread. So this is right. before the Industrial Revolution, but people built these giant, you know, two or three story machines uh, that ran on water power and twisted, you know, hundreds of silk bobbins at a time. And they were running, you know, 24 seven uh, during the silk as a seasonal product so right. it didn't run all the year long and it's just extraordinary i mean you can't and some of the places i visited are recreations and some are there was one place that actually was operating in till the 30s and so describe that you, you mentioned going to italy tell me about where, where was this uh this uh, this ancient uh silk spinning so, or spill right silk so mill. in this in it's it's basically in the in the Foot, foothills of the Alps in the Piedmont region. Um, there are different towns. There, I went to three different places that are kind of scattered uh, across an east-west sort of region in Piedmont. So it's in the parts of Italy where there was good water power, mm. uh, and 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 it's still the industri you know part of the industrial heartland of Italy uh, because these early factories established a kind of way of life that continues to this day they were very precise they were uh you know uh, they were very mechanically in ingenious um right. and, and so that kind of it was pre-industrial revolution but it sort of jump-started that type of production in in that area of italy 
I, I read that and I thought that was really interesting. And you pointed out this is fully 200 years before what we think of as the beginning of the yeah. industrial revolution, yeah. but you're going to have mechanics, you're going to have other special yeah. specialty tradesmen that are, are working for the factories. And then of course, all the other, you know, food vendors and other people that are doing service for the people working in the factory. Right, but right. Uh, well, so I'll just yeah. relate a couple things that to me, w one of the reasons why I'm so enthusiastic. Um, so I lived on Navajo land for a couple of years when I, oh, was, a, yeah, when, right. when I was a kid. And one of the faults of the book was somebody on Amazon, party, there's nothing about it, Navajo weaving in this. And that's just because there can't be everything. <laughs> but I rented a Hogan for a year or more and the, the landlady, she was, she would spin wool and, and with, you know, use it with her hand. And then she had uh -huh. a, a loom. And uh, so I've been a big fan of, well, you can see I have a Navajo rug behind. Yeah. Yeah, I can this see is behind a, you. An eye dazzler from uh, about that in Ganado. And, 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 and then, so the other, in fact, I have two representatives. The pillows are made from a, a Lauren, my wife, sewed them from fabric we bought in Baru in India. Those are block print uh, fabrics yeah, from India. Yeah. <clears throat> so, two examples of my predilection for fabrics. But the, you know, both were formative, but the, 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 the visit to the the factory in Baru was just amazing to see these huge, you know, I think they're 10 meter long pieces of fabric and the block printing was just incredible. Yeah, I mean, that has been called the, the fabric that changed the world, those Indian block prints, because before uh, the trade with India started, Europeans didn't really have prints. I, there's some exceptions, but they're sort of banner, temporary banners in churches. But basically, in Europe, patterning was done with weaving. Uh -huh. So you would have stripes and plaids. If it was very expensive, you could have, you know, brocades. That was extremely, you know, you needed a very fancy process. And there were certain things in between, the kinds of patterns that you can make on a loom by varying which uh, Sort but of but rose. not this but not this resist process that there were the yes you didn't have block prints you didn't have prints right and also uh, the Indian dyers had figured out how to dye on cotton which is not easy it's actually harder to dye on uh, cellulose fi fibers than on protein fibers like wool or silk so they they had figured out how to dye really well on cotton and to make it so that it would it wouldn't fade in the wash. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it was a very trial and error kind of process that they had developed. So when these prints with these patterns and the, these color fast dyes hit Europe and also they were cotton and they were lightweight, they were, it was a revelation. And mm. it really... Uh, kinds of reactions it set off uh it set off protectionism it set off as i said for 73 years uh and all cotton cloth imports uh, and, and they didn't just ban it in a kind of civil way it was a criminal offense like with coke Cocaine is the best analogy because everything that happens with cocaine happens with these prints in, in uh, that period. Um, at, so you had that, but you also had people trying to figure out, like, well, how could we uh, spin cotton? Our spinners aren't good enough to spin these sort of strong cotton threads in, 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 in England. Uh, how can we emulate these Indian cottons, and that led to trying to do it mechanically, which you know, sets off the Industrial Revolution. There's also many, a great deal with the history of British colonialism, which I don't get in, into in the book, but uh, that is another aspect of, of, of what, uh, you know, the desirability of getting cotton textiles from India uh, helped jumpstart that as well. Right. Well, and it's remarkable that these industries <clears throat> and the and the facility we went to, I mean, we really did just stumble on to it. We drove to Baru. We didn't know where we were going. And a guy rides up on a motorcycle and says, what are you all doing here? Well, we're looking for a block print pattern. He follow, well, follow me. And it had, turns out his whole family has this block yeah. print family and yeah. or a block printing operation. It's right in the middle of town. And we saw that we went into this really kind of a bunker building and it was just stacked floor to, you know, mid seat, you know, mid height on with these just incredible fabrics. And so yeah. we, we bought a bunch and brought them back 
back and Lauren sewed uh, skirts and yeah. pillows. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just been remarkable. But that uh, the point that I'm getting to is how ancient that technique is now. I mean, yeah. it, this goes back. How many centuries would that be now that they've been doing this? Oh, I I don't even know when that starts. I mean, it it must be. Uh, it's probably a thousand years I, or close to it. I, it's it's they, it was by the time Europeans started trading with India it was highly developed, and that and the European trade with India starts in the really in the fifteenth century with uh, with the Portuguese, and then it becomes a big deal. Um, late 16th, mostly 17th century is when it really becomes a big deal. Uh, but that's just the trade with Europe. Before that, they were exporting to Southeast Asia uh, to, you know, so there was a huge Indian trade in these these kinds of prints to, you know, to their east uh, right. as well. They, they had So they not only had highly developed textile techniques, that highly developed trading techniques and and you know merchant families and all of right. that sort of thing too and and again this is cotton fiber are there cotton, yeah yeah cotton cotton, cotton. i mean the, also silk but but pri cotton is the big one right and that's all we bought was it well we bought a little bit a few things that were silk but almost all cotton but it, which brings me to to uh the section on cotton which i think was really uh remarkable uh, I'm going to read this part again because I thought it was so well done here. You say you, you wrote from Mexico south to Ecuador. Cotton was one of the treasures of the new world. Native peoples used finely woven cotton cloth for tribute, trade goods and ceremonial objects. Cotton sails powered the ocean going balsa rafts that traded along the Pacific coast of Latin America. Cotton batting padded the cloth uh, and leather armor of Aztec and Inca warriors. And this is the part that I think is really quite amazing. Cotton furnished the cords for the uh, quippies on which the Incas kept records encoded in knots. When the Incas first faced the Spanish in battle, their cotton tents extended for three and a half miles. Quote, so many tents were visible that it truly frightened us, wrote a Spanish chronicler. We never thought that Indians could maintain such a magnific magnificent estate nor have so many tents. So this 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 ability to to you know produce textiles is is pre colonial in in the in in the Americas and that the Spaniards are looking at all their tents and saying holy crap we might be in trouble here <laughs> Which, yeah yeah I mean, however they had horses and steel so that was the, their advantage but yes I well there there there's a, a number of things going on that are you know developed in the in the chapters uh, one which I talk about earlier in the book is that. What we one thing we forget is what an important military asset textiles were and still are actually a lot of the uh, cutting edge textile research today is funded by the military. It's about you know very you know developing fabrics that can have certain protective qualities or you know mean you don't have to carry batteries or all these kinds of things but but when you're in the era of sales the the production of textiles is a huge right. deal like, um and uh you know it took longer to make a viking sail than to make a viking ship uh you know i, I was um, gonna, i was gonna use that yeah, that yeah. Reference, and of course tents ahead. even today it's a major military uh, military still uses tents uh but that was a, a big deal as well so that's one thing and then as you point out textiles were a really big deal in um Latin American uh, in those cultures, particularly, uh, well, the Incan culture is probably like the highest developed textile, but but also the Maya, also the Aztecs, and the Aztecs levied, you know, who conquered many other peoples in what is now Mexico, they levied very heavy tributes in textiles as well as other things on on their conquered people so uh they were a very very big deal and then the cotton in the new world for weird genetic reasons that i discussed uh, was better than the cotton in the old world so it was better than the cotton in india or the cotton in africa or the levant uh it it i because it had more genes that people could play with and so and the, and the uh, fibers were longer and stronger right was they that were the longer and stronger and more abundant um so the cotton there are four 
domesticated cotton species, or there, there were uh, two in the old world and two in the new. All of them come originally from Africa uh, before people. <laughs> mm. uh, so how cotton got from the old world to the new world is a, a mystery because there are lots of cotton species. There's around 50 cotton species uh, in the world, but most of them have no fiber. Most of them, the seed is like like a peach, you know, mm-hmm. it has maybe a little. Um, so this mutation happens in Africa, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. Uh, when human beings show up, they domesticated, and they domesticated in Africa probably around what's now you. And then they domesticated in the Yucatan and in Peru. And because somehow this African seed got to the Yucatan, we don't know how, you know, hurricane or something, and it crossbred with one of these native uh, cottons that didn't have any, uh, any fiber, it ended up with twice as many genes. And so then when human beings showed up, they had more genetic material to play with. Now, of course, obviously, they don't know what genes are, but it's trial and error. So in the Americas, they were able to develop more abundant cotton, and particularly in Peru, that's what we now know as Pima cotton uh, or uh, 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 Sea Island cotton. That's the It's called Gossipian barbadense is the official name, and that's the really long fiber cotton, luxurious cotton, and it's about 10% of the world's commercial cotton produced. And then the, the one that came from the Yucatan, which is called Gossipian hirsutum, is the one that's like 90% of the world's cotton uh, today. So once this this... Latin American cotton was discovered by Europeans. It just pretty much over time, like pushed out all the other cotton. Uh, right. But then there was then the improvements in, in genetics then in the U S and you point out the, the, the gradual uh, growth in cotton. And I think you said at one, that there was a fourfold increase over a pe- period yeah. of 60 years and so on. Yeah. Um, but then I, I like this other part because, you know, I like numbers. Oh, oh, I wanted to ask. So are you trained as an economist, historian? What you, uh, you, you went to school, I, I'm assuming, so, for these? Or do you, uh, well, what, what's your background? Yes and no. So I was actually a major in English literature, uh, specializing in the Renaissance. But I took economics every term when I was in college. And my husband is a PhD economist, and I've hung around economists. I've been an economics writer, uh, journalist for a long time. So I know a lot of economists. Uh, At Chapman, I actually teach in a program that integrates uh, economics and the humanities. So I co-teach with an economist uh, uh, in well, a but do you, well, So do you but, consider, well, I, I think of myself as a reporter, right? I don't, I don't, yeah, you know, right. I don't, I, I so just I hesitate think- to call myself a reporter because I do reporting, but it's not, I have too much respect for people who do it full time. <laughs> to, I mean, I have been a reporter in my yeah, life. I yeah. started out as a journalist, uh, a normal, you know, <laughs> beat reporter kind of journalist, a uh, business journalist specifically. Uh, but then uh, in my mid 20s, uh, when I went to work at Reason Magazine uh, and then eventually was the editor of Reason Magazine. And so that took me more into the opinion policy world policy yeah. analysis and then in and in my later books i also wandered into sort of more sociological stuff so uh, one of my one of my great skills is to be able to read academic literature of various kinds and translate it and talk to people who do uh, well, god you know, bless you uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah right so people who do better research of various better kinds and, and and turn it into you know find what's interesting and translate right. it for you know the it, not really the general public but the curious educated public that isn't specialists sure well so how's the book done i i, I know it's not out in paperback um you have a ton of reviews on Amazon. Did yeah, you, how yeah. many have you sold, or do you know those numbers? Um, I haven't. I, you know, there as you probably know, there's a lag, so I don't know exactly. Sure, of course. <laughs> I'm guessing that it's probably at this point around the order of twenty thousand mm-hmm. um, uh, from you know 
all formats, including there's an audio book, sure. uh, and you Kindle know, including and so on. the British yeah. and all that. Uh, but I, you know, don't hold me to it. But it's no. uh, it's that order of magnitude. So it's by you know it's successful. Uh, by the lights of you know publishing puts me in the upper I think three percent or something, sure. but it's not a bestseller. Right. Uh, it continues to sell. I think it'll sell for a long, long time because it's not something that's going to get out of date. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, I had this interesting experience of the book came out during COVID. Right. Thank God, I got everything done before everything shut down because. Yeah, I couldn't have gone and done reporting. I couldn't have. It, all the libraries were even closed. Sure. Uh, and there's a lot that's not on the internet. But anyway, so my publicity was doing lots and lots of Zoom talks, right? <laughs> Podcasts, which, which, but which also is, talks is, right. to you know fiber arts groups, talks to schools, uh, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Uh, so just a reminder, my guest is Virginia Postrel. She's the author of Fabric of Civilization: How Textiles Made the World. Uh, you can find her at vpostrel.com. Uh, she also has a substack, vpostrel.substack.com. Uh, I recommend the book. I thought it was just fabulous. I really, really liked it. Um, and you, you have also this great stuff about, uh, and I love numbers, and I love you know how you you, you explain some of the 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 the, the labor and the uh, you know these quantities. <laughs> so uh, you you write consider a twin bedsheet with a modest thread count of two hundred and fifty. Weaving it requires about 29 miles of thread, enough to extend from downtown San Francisco to the Stanford University campus, or from Kyoto to Osaka. Queen size sheet takes about 37 miles, which would stretch from the Washington Monument to Baltimore, or from the Eiffel Tower to Fontainebleau. And then you go on and you have these these comparisons on uh, jeans and the amount of yarn required, six miles. Um, and how long it would take with a spinning wheel, uh, or in the Bronze Age, something like 37 days of spinning to uh, to produce that quantity of material. And then you have sails here as well, which goes back to the discussion about uh, uh, the seagoing ships and so on, the amount of yarn required 60 miles, and how long that would take to produce. I mean, it, it, I'd never thought about it in those terms. And that was one of the reasons why I thought your book was just so remarkable is that it's just a, a, a way of seeing the world like, a, well, my, I've written a book on electricity. Look at the world through the lens of electricity. You looked at the world through the lens of textiles and brought in all these things that I had no idea about. So here's a question. Was there, I, I, I responded to Wallace Carruthers, the inventor of oh, nylon. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, fantastic. I was a fan of nylon from the time I was a kid. I thought, well, this stuff is amazing. And I still think it's amazing. I love nylon rope. Um, was there one of these inventors that the, you, you talk about, plant geneticists, people, or the chemist dies and, and, and uh, nylon, any ones that... Uh, are you uh, um, a favorite or one that stands out in terms of who uh, touched you or, or that uh, makes uh, has the most interesting story? Well, Wallace Carruthers is a wonderful and really sad story. I mean, it's wonderful because he's the, the inventor, this, the inventor of nylon. He's the inventor of nylon and, and um, the, uh, also the inventor, his first big invention was actually neoprene. Uh, but I don't tell that story, but there is a picture of him because there's, and he was, he was this brilliant chemist, um, who kind of came from nowhere. <laughs> um, but and was teaching, but was teaching at Harvard. He was teaching at Harvard, but how he got to Harvard was he sort of came from nowhere. <laughs> it was a long story, which I didn't go into, but came out of the Midwest and this, um, and he, he was teaching at Harvard, and DuPont wanted to start a, a research laboratory. So this was in the late 20s. And they kept asking him. They wanted to recruit. Somebody had recommended him, and they wanted to recruit him. And he said no, because he suffered from terrible depression. And he would kind of disappear from whatever he was doing for long periods of time and you know be depressed and be drunk and then go back and work but and so he told them look i have these problems he didn't go into total detail but he told them i have these issues that make me more suitable for this academic setting than i would be in industry but they were very determined and they 
did finally come back and they made him a really good offer. And he had, in the meantime, come up with a just a purely scientific puzzle that he was interested in, which was the int- question of what are these, th- there were these really big, seeming molecules. There were things like proteins and starches that had these very big molecular weights that were like much bigger than anybody could account for. And in fact, most people, most chemists thought that it wasn't really one molecule, it was some artifact. But he wanted to figure out what they were, which is polymers. And he, so he went to DuPont to do, the, they said you can research anything you want. It doesn't have to be practical. And so he wanted to figure out polymers. And he did. And he figured out that they were these long chain molecules and that, in fact, it was a single molecule where things uh, repeat. And this is the basic science that we need basically have our material world that we have and then when the great depression came along after a while his boss said look um wallace uh i know we told you you could do whatever you want but we got to come up with some products here and why don't you work on this type of of polymer that's called aramine uh, because wool is that and so he worked on that and out of that came nylon which was the first um the, the first synthetic fiber. and uh, But he killed himself before it actually made the market because of his terrible depression. So it's a really, he's this really wonderful, really, really important person. And the people who worked with him loved him and thought highly of him. But he was just haunted by depression throughout his entire life. And he didn't help it by self-medicating with alcohol, which actually makes depression worse. And, and so then he killed himself. And you, you know, you sort of think, what else could have happened? So that was a very powerful story and something that is, you know, close to our time. I mean, you know, right. it's, uh, it's, it's nearly a hundred years now, but but you know it's not like uh, Will, oh, I mean, William Perkin, who came in with the first die, was fantastic, uh, a, a fantastic story because he was a teenager when he developed that, and you know. Uh, but a lot of the people who did important things, we don't even know their names because right. it happened so long ago. Well, the nylon, you, you, you point out that it was fabricated from benzene, which uh, yeah. can, is, is a derivative. It's common in petrochemical and, and yeah. petroleum, but it was, I guess then it was being derived from coal. Um, and uh, you wrote that Carruthers didn't live to see the success of nylon or the world-changing ripple effects of his work. On April 29th, 1937, his lifelong depression finally proved unendurable. Early that morning, he checked into a hotel, took out the cyanide capsule he'd carried since graduate school. Mixed the poison in a glass of lemon juice and killed himself. He was forty-one years old. Um, yeah, it is amazing because I can remember as a chi- as a kid, even you know, I, I remember it to this day. That looking at those little, little filaments and thinking, "Wow, this is so cool!" and this is so incredibly strong. How is this possible? And it was. Yeah. It, it still leaves me amazed because I look at this thin rope and I think this is crazy strong for the the. But it's because those filaments are. I think you point out are, are similar in, in in like silk in that they can make make them so yeah. long and therein right. lies the key to right. the strength. Yeah, and unlike silk, there is no theoretical limit. I mean, because silk comes from a cocoon, and the cocoon right. is only no so worms, big. No so, worms needed so, here. So even with silk, you have to eventually sort of stick the different filaments together, which is part of the skill that made those Italian factories we talked about earlier work. But yeah, so it's amazing. And the other thing is, although nylon, of course, is very, very important in textiles, you mentioned rope being another thing, which, you know, not a textile. The first commercial application of it was for toothbrush bristles. Oh, so this is right. the kind yeah. of thing we don't even think about today, that people used to brush their teeth with wooden toothbrushes with bristles that came from boars. Right from animal bristles and the bristles would fall out and they would break and they would get caught in your teeth. And, you know, this idea of the standardized kind of sanitary uh, uh, nylon toothbrush is something we owe to Wallace Carruthers as well. And it's not that, I mean, it's not that long ago. No, it's I mean, not my, that long my, ago. My mother was born in 1920. So this is not, yeah, you know, this yeah. is not, so not ancient it was history. Within her lifetime, you know, within her teen years, it would have happened. Yeah. Right. 
Well, and I thought the structure of the book was interesting as well, and how you talk about the weft, the weave, and then you talk about fabric, and then you talk about finishing and and finishes. And this was one thing that I I know a little bit about this, but I thought this is in the latter part of the book you talk about finishing, finishing, and you talk about metal organic frameworks. And I thought this was <laughs> that I I recognize that fr that term because I'd heard it used in for fuel tanks, right? Yeah, there was an yeah. idea that it would be used for oh, what it was it decarbonized corn husks or something there was an uh -huh. idea that these yeah. were going to be able to store more natural gas i think it was in these tanks i haven't seen it be commercialized yeah, yet yeah, but yeah. talk about that part because i thought <laughs> okay. that was well i think it was just interesting yeah. too the it brought back to well how does this relate to me and right right i don't really like uh, these non-iron shirts you know i oh yeah they're yeah. easier to manage right and i i don't like to iron but there's right. something about the hand of it that's like yeah, it's yeah. just a little creepy you know and yeah. so would i rather have a few wrinkles or this non-iron fabric yeah. that is feels weird but it's because of the f the finish that's applied to the top of the cotton right, um, right. so talk about that and and then weave weave in uh okay. the the metal organic frameworks what are, what yeah. are they and and what how is this a new approach in the finishing yeah. of fabrics yeah so i don't talk a lot in the book about finishing although it is a pro that final final process of textile uh finishing is a part that goes back long way in other ways so uh, our phrase in on tenter hooks comes from stretch they used to wet wool pound it and and do uh, uh what was called fulling with certain kinds of uh, mud that had certain chemicals in it and then finish and then wash it and stretch it out and then trim it and that was the stretching out was the tenter hooks which are mm. kind of scary things but anyway to get to your more contemporary question so a lot of the progress uh that that consumers may have noticed or not <laughs> in their clothes in the past say 20 or 30 years comes from various forms of finishing uh the no wrinkle uh stuff being but also anti-stain and this is the application of various kinds of chemicals to the finished product to imbue it with certain um, non-stink non-stink so, non certain iron, kinds right, of yeah of qualities that people want. Um, so that's why you don't have to do laundry nearly as much as people 40 years ago uh, for the same, and and, uh, and ironing and that. Uh, but people today are looking for better ways of finishing. Some of them uh, are looking for uh, more environmentally friendly ways. And I talk about a company in um, Boston that's using uh, uh, silk basically uh, but they're like breaking it apart and taking it down to its basic uh sort of chemicals to to create a, a kind of a fin various finishes and then i talk about uh this guy at uh, cornell uh who works on metal organic frameworks which he calls his favorite molecule and i'm gonna garble the science terribly but basically you picture a ring with different uh sort of balls uh, made of of you know, these metal organic compounds and the metals are the balls and and it's a thing where you, a, a molecule where you can put something in the middle and again i'm like yeah no grossly keep, keep going, no, keep, keep but going. you can put something in the middle and it'll hold it right uh, and so his idea and he's very much and explicitly in the book a basic researcher he's fascinated uh in you know how the basic research he's not trying to think is it chemical is it commercialized but he's also interested in working with cotton because he thinks that's the challenge is don't try to come up with a new fiber don't you know let's work with the thing that people use and so he's trying to figure out ways where you could put into these metal organic frameworks um molecules that would have various properties that you would create a structure that you could then essentially lay across the fabric also the other thing about metal organic frameworks is you can make them whatever size you want it's sort right. of it's sort of like a polymer strand like we were talking with nylon but it's in two dimensions so it's 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 a plane instead of a strand right and and so you could create a framework that you could lay across the textile of however you know however many 
thousands or tens of thousands of yards you wanted and it would repel water or it would uh, uh, be antibacterial or, you know, whatever quality it would, making it no iron is difficult, but, right. but you know, it would have these various properties uh, that uh, you want in your textile. And because this would be at kind of a nano level, it's, at, it's just one molecule thick, essentially, you wouldn't notice it as a person wearing, it wouldn't feel right. like anything. Right. And, the, and you also mentioned the idea that it can maybe be refilled or replenished. Or yeah, something like that, it could which, potentially be replenished because if if you have if you put something in it that over time is dispersed every time you wash it or right, every, it, right. it depends on what it is, then you might be able to have a way where you'd retreat it and refill it and it becomes sure. longer wearing. In, and so this is very much the cutting it. I mean, this is... You know, this is not coming to a, a clothing store near you anytime soon. But what I was doing in that last chapter, which begins with Carruthers, is looking at contemporary innovation. And interestingly, what I found is different from Carruthers' time or different from earlier periods. What happens today is people get interested in some scientific problem. And then they discover that the thing they're interested in can be applied to textiles. And because textiles are so pervasive, then they realize, wow, if I apply to textiles, that would make a big deal in the world. And mm. so, the, they, so they don't start out with the textiles and then try to apply the science. They start out with the science and then say, wow, textiles really are everywhere. And if I apply my scientific interest to textiles i could change the world <laughs> so are there fabrics you won't wear then you mentioned wool yeah wool it, i don't it, wear it, wool no uh, polyester i wear polyester not a lot but i do and a lot of things nowadays have uh you know our blends right um, which i don't i don't like well. i just don't yeah it, it, well and also even on a t-shirt a, a cotton poly blend I, I i i know if i read it maybe that just reinforces yeah. it but i, I feel I that the hand of it i'm just kind of like yeah i don't yeah, I just don't yeah. like it as much um but uh, I would say the only fiber that I don't wear at all of the big four or big five, if you include polyester, it is wool. Uh, although I don't, linen is problematic. Um, I, although I'm actually wearing some mixed linen and cotton pants at the moment. But, uh, but linen can be very wrinkly. Right. If it's, it, 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 linen tends to be one of two things. Either it's it tends to wrinkle fast, or it tends to have little scratchy things in it. Yeah. Uh, depends on the nicer kinds of linen often wrinkle. Although again, finishes have made that better. You know, you mentioned wool, and as you were saying that, I was thinking, you know, that for well, I don't know how many decades or, or even centuries that soldiers, athletes, they're wearing wool outfits, and oh, I'm thinking, I know. damn, that must have just been awful, you know, to yeah, march around yeah. in a wool oh. in a wool uniform yeah, in the summertime yeah. and yeah. carrying a rifle and a bunch of bivouac stuff, and I just think, oh man, that must have just been dreadful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the other thing is, of course, wool compared to you may dis polyester, but it's better for various technical fabrics uh you know if you were in the cold in the weather in the rain wool it it starts out okay but over time it becomes sodden and it becomes a problem uh, oh i know and 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 these new and some of these as you were pointing out these new lighter weight fabrics uh well gore-tex obviously and you know yeah. the the mountaineering industry and you know i think about you know the old mountaineers right in the 20s or whenever when the serious yeah. mountaineering started well the late 1800s even they're climbing up there in these wool outfits and they're getting yeah. snowed on rain although on they everything. usually wore silk as base layers right yeah uh because it's not as you know it's not as good as the polyester you know highly engineered stuff we have today but it has some of those properties of, of, uh, so i actually wrote uh an article about how polyester went from the you know, sort of leisure suit, disco, uh, I'm, I'm bad, old, I remember you know, that 1970s era, yes. ick, uh, polyester to this high performance material. Uh, so it, it, I, I did it, I don't know, maybe six months ago, mm -hmm. uh, or not even, uh, so it's on worksinprogress.co, which is a publication out of, um, 
of England that I think uh, your listeners would probably be very interested in, not just my article, but the general range of things that they cover. Huh. Interesting. So what about the, I mean, we talked about the people that were, um, you, you thought were interesting. Anything that surprised you when you were doing this? I mean, that's one of the things that, uh, well, I, you know, people ask me about, well, my, I'll, this written effect relates to fabric, but going, what surprised me about the research that I did in for the question of power when I went to India it was just the level of poverty. I, I hadn't oh, any, yeah. no experience for the level of poverty there. That, that surprised me. Um, but it, it's a general question in doing this. And how long did it take you to write the book? It took um, about two and a half years of, uh, uh, from the time I got a contract. You know, so I was officially doing a book to the time the manuscript was submitted. And one year of that, it was essentially the only thing I did. Right. A year and a half, I was working on it around other things as well. Right. It was, so was there, I'll ask that question, but so was there something that surprised you in, in these different, you, you traveled a fair amount, you looked at a lot, you looked at a different, a lot of technologies, a lot of innovators, a lot of people, uh, anything that, yeah. that stood out well, in terms of surprise? Well, we've, we've touched on a few things already that surprised me. Um, uh, the, the Italian silk throwing mills probably surprised me the most, <laughs> but that they, uh, were, that they were the that, industrial revolution before, they, the, before industrial the industrial revolution, revolution and, and, the and it was scale, around silk and it was around and, silk instead and, of right. Cotton. And that's why it doesn't change the world is because it's just this, you know, this thin layer of society. It's just the luxury. Right. And that, it, and that it was in a relatively confined area in one section in Italy and wasn't, it wasn't transatlantic then as well. Was no, that, it wasn't transatlantic. Although there is an industrial espionage story that I tell where it did make it to England, hmm. uh, through, uh, through you know, sneakiness. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that probably helped fuel the industrial revolution as well. But, but that really surprised me. And, and it's partly just the scale. I mean, it's not just the idea that they had factories before the industrial revolution. That's amazing enough, but the, uh, that surprised me. The, the, the strides that have been made in textile archeology span and the, you know, once people started thinking, hey, we should pay attention to textiles in archaeology, mm. uh, the fact that there's 6,200-year-old cloth from Peru that's dyed with indigo, I mean, that was amazing. Um, and, and, that, and that surprised me. I'm interrupting you. I asked you, yeah, but I thought yeah. that it was in the beginning of the book, you, you, doc, you, you report on the fact that some of these cutting devices actually had fiber remnants on that and that they could recover them and figure them out. And yes, I thought and well, actually, that, was, that was cool. That one of the things that was amazing about that. So between the book time that I submitted the manuscript, so it was like December of 2019 and the time that I revised the manuscript, which I don't remember, you know, you have to wait for the editor and then, right. so let's say March, but it might even been earlier. The earliest thing in the book went from 20 or 30,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago, because that research that you're referring to, which is where they identify this little piece of string. And it's clearly yeah, right. when you look at it under microscope, it is not some random vine. It has been twisted and then it has been plied. So two pieces have been twisted together. That was made by Neanderthals. And it was found by looking at a cutting tool, you know, a it was like embedded in in yeah. a in a tool um so uh you know these people are discovering things all the time and uh and, and part, the history and the history expanded just in the time you were writing in the, the time book. and in like a three-month period i mean it was like at, between the time i published uh, wrote that thought it was done and then the time that i was revising it you know mainly in ex response to editors comments sure. uh, i wasn't ex uh so that that's happening all 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 the time there's new discoveries being made so that was pretty pretty amazing um but it's hard much harder obviously of course cloth is much more recent it's sure. nine or ten thousand years old uh not 50 and it wasn't made by neanderthals but uh, but still people are finding more discoveries uh, all all the time uh and that and that was pretty remarkable um and just the the 
indigo is fascinating. So nowadays, indigo we know mostly as the the blue and blue jeans, mm-hmm. um, and it is done now synthetically. Uh, you know, but that same chemical was found in plants all around the world, different plants that aren't even related to each other. It's a very complicated process to make indigo dye because you, uh, well, I go into it, but you have to like make it and then you have to break it down and then you have to put the, whatever you're dying in and it comes out green and it turns, uh, it, it turns blue and as it oxidizes, it's very complicated, but it was figured out independently in in India where we get the word indigo in Europe where it was a called something called woad in all different parts of Africa and Southeast Asia and Japan and, dis- and, and discovered China indi- and, and discovered simultaneously independently independently and in yeah. Peru uh, and and the Americas <laughs> um, so and, and not only discovered independently but the plants are not related to each other they have the same chemical in them but they're you know, completely different plants, but somehow people discovered that they could make this blue. And that's really, you know, it kind of shows you the power of observation and trial and error and, and also the pursuit of beauty. And, you know, why do you want things to be blue when right. however they come off the plant or animal would be just fine functionally? Obviously, sure. you want something more. Sure. And you end the book, I'll, I'll read the, just another short passage here. You said, uh, this is right, I think, in the, the final uh, paragraphs of the book, hidden in every piece of fabric are the actions of curious, clever, and desiring men and women, past and present, known and unknown, <clears throat> from every corner of the globe. This heritage does not belong to a single nation, race, or culture, or to a single time or place. The story of textiles is not a male story or a female story, not a European, African, Asian or American story, it is all of these, cumulative and shared, a human story, a tapestry woven from countless brilliant threads. That's just great stuff right there. I think it's really good. Um, So uh, let me ask you, uh, Jeff, uh, we've been talking for nearly an hour. Again, my guest is uh, uh, Virginia Postrel. She's written this great book uh, called The Fabric of Civilization. I recommend it highly. Uh, Fabric of Civilization, How Textiles Made the World. It was published in 2020. You can find her at vpostrel.com or on substack, vpostrel.substack.com. Are you working on another book now? Not yet. I have a few irons in the fire ideas that I think might be interesting down the road, but I haven't yet settled on a topic. You know, when you write a book, I'm sure you know this, you have to, it's, it's not a short-term project. There's yeah. the whole time you spend I, I writing the book. I, I, look, I hesitated to ask because it's like, oh, you're yeah. going to do another one? I just finished yeah, right. God no, damn it. Why no, but it's not just that. You, know, ha- you have to find something that you're willing yeah. to live with for, yeah. let's say, a minimum of five years. Even if you write the book really fast, there's all the time that's spent doing things like this. And so you have to be really enthusiastic about yes. the subject. And there yeah. are lots of things that I write articles about that I wouldn't write a book about because yeah. I'm interested yeah. in them at the article length, not and, at the right. and you immerse don't want your to, life in. You don't want to yeah. be married to it for that long. Yeah. Right? There's, no, <laughs> right. there's no misery like a book deadline. Right. Um, <laughs> Well, so what are you reading now? This is the two last questions for you. I ask these of all my guests. Um, they introduce themselves. I ask what they're reading, and then I'll ask another one. But what what books on the top of your shelf, or top of your list now? Or are you reading on Kindle? You do you, right, what, what, right, what's right. what's on the list? Uh, so I'm teaching a class at Chapman called uh, Ambition and the Meanings of Success, mm. which is one of these classes that integrates economics and the humanities. So. At the moment, the book on the top of my shelf is Willa Cather's The Song of the Lark, which is one of the books that we, I mean, I've read it multiple times, but it's what we're reading in class uh, uh, at the moment. So that's that's what I'm reading. I just uh, just got the book Super Abundance, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. Um, uh, Mar- Marion Tupi's book. Tupi's yeah, yeah. book. Uh, but I haven't really I, dived. I need, I need to have him on the podcast. I've had his name yeah. on the list for a long time. I haven't done it yet. But yes, go uh, ahead. Uh, so I'm I'm I'm, re- uh, I'm I'm about to dive into that, and I just got a, another book that somebody sent me, and I can't remember the name of it. It's it's, it's forthcoming. It's something like How We Build or something. It's about mm. It's about building things. Excuse me. Gotcha. And so, uh, last question then, uh, Virginia, what, what gives you hope? There are a lot of challenges in the world today. There are a lot of things that uh, yeah. 
I mean, where to begin in terms of things that look challenging or risky or, you know, that uh, are big hurdles facing us? What, what, what makes you optimistic as you look at the world today? <laughs> well, I think what makes me optimistic, and you're absolutely right, is partly, especially after writing this book, I, I have developed a longer term perspective. So there are lots of things in the short term that worry me greatly. Um, and in the medium term. And some of them are the kinds of things that could stop everything. I mean, things are getting kind of scary with the Russians. But uh, yeah. um, but I have a great deal of hope ab- around what's happening today uh, scientifically around biology, particularly synthetic biology. I'm really interested in that. I, I think that that is a, a field that is both super interesting uh, and has great potential for solving a lot of problems and increasing, uh, you know, prosperity, reducing poverty, but also, you know, decrease, but doing so in ways that potentially decrease uh, environmental impact. Um, uh, so whether it, it Partly because of writing a book on textiles, I have gotten really interested in materials. Mm-hmm. I've always had some interest in it, but the, but so that's an area. And I guess the other thing is, it's just thinking about how how human beings have so much potential for creativity and uh, you know self improvement and curiosity. And not everybody, but there's a lot out there and. When you have all of which you docu- documented in this yeah, book, and and the more people sort of get to part, the more individuals feel open to participating in that. I think the the more we can unleash that potential, and so I have I have uh, have hope in that area too. But it's a scary time, I will say. <laughs> Well, we can agree on that, and <clears throat> we'll probably uh, we'll stop right there. My uh, Virginia uh, Postrel, uh, thanks a million for being on the Power Hungry podcast. It's been great. I recommend highly her new book, Fabric of Civilization, How Textiles Made the World. I will say I loved it, and uh, uh, my wife, Lauren, is going to – we ordered the hard copy. She's going to read it. Um, Excellent. You can find Virginia's work, vpostrel.com and vpostrel.substack.com. Virginia, thanks again. Thank you. It's been great. And thanks to all of you in podcast land. Tune in uh, for the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. Until then, see ya.